If you enjoyed the festival, you'll be interested in this invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, an opportunity like this cannot be taken for granted. This evening, we are going to be beating our hearts out for you all, so I want to see people enjoying themselves. So get up and feel the music and do something about it, okay? This event is a right of cultural democracy. We have many, many partners, you included. I encourage you to stand alongside with us as we travel this journey year after year. Welcome to the 2022 Smithsonian Folklife Festival. For over 50 years, the festival has convened people on the National Mall to explore the power of culture and creativity in our lives today. This year, we feature artists and partners from the United Arab Emirates and Earth Optimism, a global conservation movement. The Smithsonian Folklife Festival is produced by the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage in partnership with the National Park Service. The festival strives to maintain an accessible and inclusive environment for visitors of all abilities. If you are in need of accessible seating options or assistive listening during this presentation, please see one of our venue volunteers. The Earth Optimism by Folklife sponsoring partners include the Ford Motor Company, HHMI Tangled Bank Studios, Roger W. Sant and the Honorable Doris Matsui, and United Airlines. In additional support is provided by the Asian Pacific Initiative Pool, Anela Ole Foundation, Ann Kaiser and Doug Lapp, Rewild, Sakaruna Foundation, and the Shared Earth Foundation. We thank them. Festival hours are 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. daily with special evening events starting at 6.30 on the main stage. And for the most up-to-date schedule information, as well as information on our speakers, their bios, and what they do, please visit our festival website, festival.si.edu. Uh, and also, we encourage you to visit the Festival Marketplace, which is located on the other side of the Smithsonian Castle, and there you can support artisans from around the world. So we encourage you to go there. It's got some great stuff. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Creativity for the Planet. This is a great session. You'll be very glad you're here. We're led by moderator Josh Tewksbury, director, Smithsonian Tropical Research Center. He's joined by Peggy Oki, environmental artist and Brian Masuga, creative conservationalist, Peppermint Narwhal. On screen, joining us virtually is Tyler Thrasher, an artist. And then we'll be joined later um, at the very end by Robin Moore, Vice President Communications and Marketing for Rewild. Thank you again. Take it away, Josh. It is such a great pleasure to be here. So I'm Josh Tewksbury, the director of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. I'm a scientist, but I'm I'm the only scientist in a family of artists, so being up here on this stage is a little like coming home. And it's a, it's a fantastic home to come home to. I'm super excited to talk with all three of our guests here. This is a two-part two program, so I'm going to introduce a fourth, a fourth person after this, after this session here. And so, but, I, but at this point, I just want to say hello and thank you to everyone here and to you, Peggy. You're like a hero on so many levels. Brian, your art has been inspiring to so many people. Tyler, I think you get the um, award on the stage, despite some stiff competition up here, for the artist most difficult to put in any one box because <laughs> you're kind of everywhere, which is super cool. But, um, but Peggy, I want to start with you. And I think, you know, and, and before asking you a question, I wanted to start a let people know that if you haven't already gone over and seen the Origami Whales Project uh, the, and the exhi exhibit over in the Earth Optimism Summit, the Earth Optimism Tent area, you should definitely go check it out. Um, because we often team, we need to visualize the loss on the planet. And I think what Peggy's done there is a tremendous job of sort of, you know, of really bringing us into an understanding of what has happened to whales and dolphins over the last 30 to 40 years. And I think we need more of that in the world. But when I told my 17 year old son I was gonna introduce Peggy here, he said, no, 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 that's not the Peggy you're introducing. You're introducing the Peggy Oki. This is the Peggy Oki <laughs> of Z-Boys, of Dogtown. This is the Peggy Oki that like transformed the skating community with this combination of fluid style and no holds barred aggressivism 
aggressive style. And I kind of feel like you bring that to everything you do, this poise, this presence, this fluidity, this passion. And, and we're just really grateful that you're doing that in service of this blue planet we live on. So I just would love to ask you about your path from, skate, from skating to whales and dolphins, and then what you want to do from here with your one wild and precious life. <laughs> well, thanks, Josh. It's really great to meet you in person, and be, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I, so skateboarding, I started doing roughly when I was about seven. And then, you know, as a child, we skateboarded. It was very treacherous back then <laughs> with the rock wheels. I call them the Fred Flintstone wheels. And then I got back into skateboarding when it was a little bit safer on the urethane wheels. And at that time also, I was starting to learn to surf. And for me, the skateboarding became my way of practicing the surfing moves, the balance and, and motion that I would be doing surfing. And there was a lot of days when there was not much surf. So then I got on the skateboard team, the Zephyr team, and we all, that was kind of all the same idea with all of us, that we really loved surfing the most, and, but then the skateboarding moves were great. And then it turned into the whole sort of culture of our team. And, uh, and so my love for surfing led me to learning more about about the beings in the ocean. And I was especially taken, I grew up as a child watching Flipper. <laughs> so it was like, oh, dolphins. And so I learned more about dolphins. I studied, uh, I was a field zoology major at, at Santa Monica College at the time. And that became my subject, the, the dolphins. I started learning more and more about dolphins and how interesting they were to me, the, how they, they in, their, in their groups, they take care of each other. The mothers always look, feed their, you take care of their young, all that kind of thing, sort, like, sort of like humans, right? And so I was, and then, and then they finding out that they surfed. So it's like, oh, I'm a surfer, they surf, this is really cool, we're connected. And, uh, and then from then on, it just became more, it just more and more of an interest for me to study more about dolphins and whales. And, um, and, then, and then learning in, uh, geez, like about the late 70s, early 80s, learning about like one of the first things that I learned as far as a threat to dolphins was the, uh, they call them uh, fishing on porpoise. And the tuna industry in the Eastern Pacific would herd dolphins. They would find dolphins herd them into a big purse scene net. So it's kind of like, like, kind of like these net bags that we have, but giant. And they would herd them in because they found that at least half the time there, there would be yellowfin tuna swimming along underneath you know, with them. For some reason, the two were found often together. So that's how they would catch tuna. And a lot of times, thousands of dolphins would be killed every year. And so I, I became aware and started working on that as a as an environmental uh, action topic, and then and then just is just moved from one to the next, and then t addressing the issue of whaling through my Odigami Whales project and engaging children through children's art as well as another form. But I thought, why don't we do it all together? Why don't we get people to fold Odigami Whales? Like at the Whale Festival in Santa Barbara, that was the first time where we started. And I set a goal of 1,400 to raise awareness that that year, in 2004, 1,400 whales were going to be killed between Japan and Norway's whaling activities. So then it just snowballed. <laughs> just kept going, going to different uh, projects. And then also uh, the big curtain of 38,000, well now it's 40,000 origami whales to represent each whale that's been reported killed since the 1986 whaling moratorium by the IWC. Hmm. And then I'm here with a different, whole other project. <laughs> I don't want to talk too long. No, you tell us a little bit about the project. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So I'm really excited to have this opportunity to raise awareness about something that's e an even bigger killer than whaling. Like whaling is a horrible thing. They chase these whales down. They, they harpoon them. Sometimes it takes hours before they actually die with a harpoon in them. Sometimes exploding harpoons that they shoot into these whales. But there's something even more horrible going on, or equally horrible. And does anybody know of another threat to the ocean, to the dolphins and whales that's going on there that's, that's even more horrible than whaling? Any, okay, so it's called bycatch and entanglement. And bycatch is basically when the fishing fleets go out there with their trawlers and the big nets and they, and they, they just drag it along and everything in its path gets caught up in these nets. 
So it's more than the one species of fish that they're targeting. It's other species of fish. It's shellfish, crabs, whatever, um, uh, dolphins, sharks, seabirds, sea lions, sea turtles, all these things get caught up in these nets depending on, especially like the shrimp industry, there's a big problem with um, mm -hmm. the sea turtles. There's still about 250,000 sea turtles every year as bycatch and entanglement. So the entanglement is the other thing, which is when the nets basically are discarded or get away from the fishing fleet, fishing boat, and they're floating around the ocean, and literally almost half of the plastic ocean pollution is fishing nets. So that's a lot of plastic floating around and sea life getting yeah. caught in it and and dying ultimately. It's like we see the good news you know, videos. Oh, we saved this whale, it had a net tangle. That is the, the minute percentage because nearly, well actually over 300,000, that's three zero zero <laughs> zero 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 a year. Do dolphins and whales die of bycatch entanglement. So I'm really excited that I'm raising awareness about this through our exhibit. We've got a couple of nets hung up. Our goal is 3,000 origami whales and dolphins. So we do the math, and that's still one one hundredth, right, of how many get killed. But you're going to see how many are there. And I, have, of course, inviting everybody to come over for origami dolphins and whales to add to our net. That's and, great. That's so, so great. Yeah. And, and so I think it's this kind of awareness building that's so important. I mean, to, to bring everyone in as a part of the solution. And Brian, I wanted to turn a little bit to you because I think, you know, um, you have been able, someone who's been able to, to do that as well. And I think you're a little like my daughter. You probably grew, you probably like were born with like a pencil in your hand and, uh, and, and you learned to sketch before you could probably even speak or something. And I, I, I love that creativity, but you know, you've been able to turn that into like connect it with your passion for wildlife and your passion for for nature and do it in a way that's like hugely accessible, you know, through peppermint narwhal and beyond. And so I just love to hear a bit about like how you made that 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 journey, how you got to that point of being able to impact with your art and where you want that art to go in the future. Sure. Um, first off, thank you for having me here today. Um, I appreciate it very much. This place has always been sort of a, a, a shrine to me. I loved coming here as a kid, <laughs> going to all these museums. So yeah, like your daughter, I, I was, you know, I, I have a nature nerd and an and a artist nerd, you know, kind of combined. Uh, I was always drawing, I was always doodling, you know, even in, sometimes in class on the textbooks, you know, I'd get in trouble for that because I just couldn't stop channeling the drawing. Um, as I you know, through my life as an artist, I, I started to realize that I could kind of marry these two things together and take the passion I had for animals and bring the creative side together and share that more with the world. And one thing that fascinated me was I grew up in a family with three sisters and I think we all loved animals, but I had this sort of degree more, like higher intensity, and they had like an average degree. and. A lot of times when we'd choose like, hey, who wants to go to the aquarium? I'd get one vote and then I'd get three not votes and they'd, we'd go somewhere else. So I, democracy was a little tough back then. So I started to think about that problem <laughs> and I started to say, how could I win more people? I, I, it's easy to speak to the passionate animal people, but how do we take that broader audience uh, and win them? And I saw creativity, you mentioned drawing, you know, as a kid, you know, before you even talk, and I, in our history as a culture, we began drawing before we talked. So mm. art, the first, I think the oldest piece of art now is a piece of red handprint uh, on a cave wall, and that is our start. Uh, so art has always been with us in the beginning. It, it gets beyond a lot of barriers. It's very accessible. It doesn't make people feel intimidated. If you see a lot of copies, sometimes you're like, well, okay, I, I don't know if I'm going to read that yet. Uh, even when I flip through a, a cool, uh, you know, Smithsonian magazine, I, I sometimes will look at the pictures and read captions or look for infographics. So I started to want to exploit that. Uh, so I started to take the creativity side and the animal side and bring them together. And one of the things I realized when you look at all these problems we face, you probably hear six mass extinction is a term that gets, Anthropocene is another term that gets tossed around that, you know, we are impacting the world in a maybe negative way, a significantly negative way, and not maybe, but significantly. So how do you fix those problems? How do you conquer them? You know, this concept of Earth optimism is very attractive to me because 
I don't want to make these things discouraging. So I thought that the best way to sort of fix most of these problems is education. Uh, most of the time we learn very little about animals, nature, science. You get a little bit in school and then the people who are really passionate get a lot more reinforcement and then we lose this vast mm -hmm. audience. So that's where I wanted to win those audiences. So I started exploiting social media and you know, I, lo I love, as much as I love, you know, going to the Hirshhorn and looking at, you know, modern artists and, and famous artists, I also love pop culture. I mean, you can see my shirt, you know, Peppermint Narwhal. So I said, you know, I think I could bring these two things together in ways, too, and have fun. And again, when you want to learn, uh, no one goes to social media to learn. They're not like, boy, I need to get some, you know, new ideas in my head. They go there <laughs> to escape, to, to play, to recreate, to just veg out. So at the same time, we're curious primates, so I can exploit that too. So I started to find ways to, you know, if you're, if you're having fun, it's so much easier to learn, you know, and learning should be fun. So these two should always stay together. They should always be intertwined. Um, it plays to our most intrinsic ability to learn, which is curiosity. So I, I try to exploit that in every graphic I make, and I try to introduce a little bit of education in every piece that I post. So I like to say we celebrate the animal kingdom from the iconic to the obscure. So I want to find your favorites, but I also want to introduce you to quolls, you know, and, and have you learn what this animal is and discover where it fits into the ecological puzzle. Because, you know, pandas are great and we've done a better job of, you know, protecting them. Uh, and they're only a part of this tapestry of an ecosystem. And again, I feel that you can't you know, we all want to protect species, we all want to protect the environment, but you can't do that unless you start by first caring. And unfortunately, you can't care about anything you're completely unaware of. So that's why, again, my puzzle answer always pointed back to education. And if I can use the work that we do to foster a greater sense of wonder, curiosity, and fun exploration, then I think that people will, will channel that themselves and go a little further than I can, I can't get everybody to the end, but I want to just maybe be there at the start and point a direction. And I think that one thing I remind all of us as, as people, especially animal lovers who, you know, I, I met, meet tons of animal lovers, but I have this weird surprise that everybody always says, oh, I love animals, but I don't love people. And I would actually say people are my favorite species of animal, and I love all animals. Um, and I would remind us that we are, um, it, even though we've done tremendous strain, you know, you, you listen to Peggy talk about, you know, the things we're doing in the ocean and the things we're doing to animals, even to just get food on our bellies, uh, you know, we cause a lot of challenges. But at the same time, we're an amazing species. We're capable of tremendous gifts to the, to the earth. Uh, we've done, I mean, you look at the Smithsonian as an example of shrines to human achievement, art, culture, language, uh, you know, science, all of these things are our contributions. We're literally going to be the first species to touch down on another planet. You know, we're already doing that through a probing sort of level. We're piercing into the world of the subatomic and looking at identifying more and more particles each day. So humans are amazing. Uh, just focus on being amazing yourself. Use that opportunity to be the most amazing human you can be. Celebrate your individuality, your uniqueness, and spread that. It's contagious. Just like the negative is contagious, this concept of Earth optimism is incredibly contagious. And if you're going out there saying, you know, we can do it. We're, look, what we, look what we've done. I mean, we've done amazing things. We've built, you know, uh, walls in China that, you know, when you go there, you're, you're blown away. You've seen pyramids. You've seen, you know, we've been doing this when we were even boggled by how we did it. So I believe in humans. I believe in us. And I think that the challenges that we have thrived as a species are great. But when we find ways to work together and, you know, foster education, understanding, empathy, I think we'll, we'll find ways to solve these problems. Wow. No, absolutely. That's fantastic. And, and Tyler, I want to go to you on screen here. And I have so many questions because your art is in, goes in so many different directions, right? You, you propagate rare and endangered plants. You do hybridization experiments. You're, you search for and grow out sports, those plants that have a single gene mutation oftentimes that changes the very nature of what they look like. You build opals. You grow crystals on insects um, and like and yes that's that and that's that that is a thing that is there and it is gorgeous so um like 
one of the things that seems to tie a lot of these activities together for me is this link between art and nature and science. And I would love to hear you talk a little bit about your path and where that's taking you today. Yeah, um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this is like a dream of mine. I tell this story quite often. I did not picture myself being um, a science-based artist. I didn't picture myself diving to the world of science when I was a kid. But me, like most kids out there, I was wildly curious about the world. I found it deeply fascinating on so many levels, and I was incredibly present. And as I got older, I started to lose that sense of presence. I started to get distracted and, and filled with anxiety and worried about the future and things I was going to do in my personal life. Um, and it wasn't until I got into college that I took a step back and I looked at the world around me and I said, well, what's happening outside of college? What's happening outside of my human, um, uh, sort of my human going on, you know? So I started caving. I went to school in Springfield, Missouri, started caving. and. I was in love. The first cave I ever crawled through, I was in love. I was in an area, in an environment that most humans won't even stick their heads in. But us in caves, you know, we go far back. And I was, it felt like I was in this holy experience and I was addicted. I was caving every weekend and I found myself slowly incorporating crystals and minerals and different formations in my art. Um, you know, I was drawing at the time, getting my degree in computer animation, and I was looking for inspiration in nature provided. And sure enough, I spent every weekend for four years looking for caves, crawling through a cave, uh, mapping out caves. And the next thing I knew, I was growing crystals. Uh, I just got more and more curious the more time I spent observing the natural world. And I quickly learned something about myself or, or relearned something I'd lost as a child, is that I love this planet. And I think most of us do. And I said, you know what? I'm going to set it all aside. And my focus is going to be on how I can continue to siphon inspiration from the natural world. Uh, and that led to things like synthesizing opals, like you see on the screen. Um, I, I have a protocol I use that I tweaked where I can grow opals in about five days. Uh, I grow crystals on insects. That's my full-time job. Uh, like you said, I hybridize plants and make new plants. And I started to also learn that the world is just this big toolbox. It's this big, beautiful, inspiring toolbox. We're surrounded by the tools and we have all the tools we need to do right by the planet and right by ourselves and our imaginations and passion. And um, I decided to dedicate every day of my career toward doing that uh, and uh, also spreading that with others. Um, like there's so many inspiring people on the stage with me now, you get this the sense that you have to share that. that is, it is critical as a human to share this, uh, this passion for nature and this, uh, the importance of being present and being observant. And that in every single one of us, there's this tiny little scientist screaming for us to stop, pause, and look at all these wonderful things that we're surrounded with and to protect it and to, and to preserve it. I mean, it's the key, it's the source of our inspiration and development as humans. And without that natural foundation, we aren't much. And so we have to preserve that. And um, that's kind of what my full-time job has turned into is growing crystals on insects, sharing my wild ideas and looking at nature and saying, hey, this is cool and this is really cool. What if we put these together and then see if other people think they're cool and see what other people, other deductions people make. Um, and just trying to encourage people to be their own personal scientist and that it's okay to be curious and that it's actually essential to uh, preserve your curiosity. Mm, oh, that's fantastic. Wow, so we have a, I, I could keep asking questions to all three of these people. Um, I do wanna make sure there's a little time if anyone in the audience wants to act, ask a question. I thought we had a mic to do that in and I was, ah, oh, there it is, okay. Um, so if there's anyone, I just want to turn to the audience to see if anyone has a question. This is your time to ask any of these people something. Just say you wanted to ask it to. You can come up to the mic. Any, anyone want to dare that mic, be the first one up there to ask some questions? Because I can keep going. We have a probably about 10 minutes before, uh, before we move on. So I'm pausing a second. That's good. OK. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just start with a, a quick question you know, to, to you, Peggy, and just, just ask a little bit about your, like, the role you see, and I can ask it to all three of you, really, it's, it's this space around 
awareness building. The, the sort of the particular, pay, the particular role that art plays in a sustainable planet, like how, how you see that link. And maybe I'll just get a little bit from each of you on that and see, see where we're headed. You probably have different ideas on it. I'll start with you, Peggy. Okay. Um, I, I, I like to raise awareness as well through, and I just one of the nicest quotes for me is by uh, Jean Michel, I mean, Jacques Cousteau, and it's, people will protect what they love. And so if we inspire the love of, th of, of things out there in the nature, uh, I really think that that's the, where the hope is. Yeah. When, people, when people realize how incredible all of these things are on this planet, we can, we can go, oh, wow, okay, oh, that's happening? Oh, what can I do about it? Yeah, have you seen that in your work? Have you seen people make that leap? I think so. That's yeah. great. That's, that must be really inspiring. That's it is, awesome. yeah, yeah. And I love sharing my enthusiasm for the different beings on the planet that I, that I know enough to speak about. Yeah, that's good. So, absolutely. Yeah, 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 that's great. Brian. Yeah, yeah I, I mentioned that, you know, a lot of times the sort of science and nature stuff that you get through your schooling is kind of limited. Uh, so, you know, what we've been doing is trying to find a way to sort of supplement and expand that. And, you know, curiosity, I think all the artists mentioned that. Uh, you mentioned the role of art in, in this sort of conservation challenge. I think it's an important one. Uh, you've probably heard of STEM. I think, you know, it really should be STEAM because I think arts are critically important as well. Uh, as we started doing what we we're doing, we started, you know, one thing that's nice about social media is as long as you do anything and repeat, you sort of build an audience by nature. Um, so maybe some of our own success has been a bit of that formula. But as you sort of have that audience, you have that opportunity to in engage them, and they have the opportunity to engage you back. And we've had researchers now and scientists actually contact us, and we've been able to collaborate with smarter and more intelligent people than us that have greater degrees of specifics. And we're able to sort of learn what they know and find a way to then say, okay, well, I, I understand this challenge this species is facing in this ecosystem. I think I know how to make a graphic that would help people who don't have all that research and time devoted and find a way to sort of make some quicker connections that'll then make bigger, bigger impact. A lot of science messages sometimes fall flat against the general audience. Most people either feel like, I don't understand it, or I can't do anything about it. So there's this huge barrier. So that's where I think art becomes this sort of bridge. Uh, I think artists are a little bit eccentric, a little bit creative problem solvers, truth sayers. So they're bold at, you know, the and microphone was intimidating to everybody, but an artist is a little bit more confident to just go out there and try it and see what happens. So I think that through that curiosity that I explore in my own work, I try to channel that back and convey that energy. And I think collaborating now with more and more different people and helping greater impact on the environment also then promotes these messages to a greater audience. That's super cool. Just one follow up on it. Like, how, like you, if you're working more and more with scientists, I'm sure you've run across the, the, uh, the passion for specificity that many scientists have on getting it right, right? And, and I'm just wondering how you balance that sort of sometimes focus on, on the detail on getting it right with the, with the sort of highest impact message, that more abstract space that you need to move in to create a message that will be acceptable to a broader, or not just acceptable, but engage a broader audience. And like, how do you, how do, you do you have a story or do you, do you play that back and forth a lot trying to get the right level of abstractness of a concept? Yeah, yeah I think that sometimes, you know, first, uh, you know, I work with a lot of people, like I said, smarter than me, and I've certainly been corrected in, in my own lack of specificity. And that's helped me make my job better. So I appreciate those criticisms. And I appreciate people who even post on our page saying, eh, you might want to you know, do a little more research because that's what we're striving for. But when I have that collaborator opportunity, I, I really like to find ways to, in the end, you know, we create a peppermint narwhal because we wanted to tell a story. And every thing you're doing is essentially telling a story. We're all kind of brands. You hear this term nowadays where that person's a, a brand. Well, we, we all are. We're all individuals. You've heard in science, every zebra stripe is unique. Every fingerprint is unique. Well, literally everything is intrinsically unique everywhere all the time. And so are you. And that's what's interesting about us. And that's what's interesting about our voice. So we try to take those voices from people who have really high degrees of knowledge and depth in something and then find a way to 
not fall off in that message and win more people by doing things that are sometimes playful, even humorous, adventurous. You know, the yeah. more we take chances sometimes, the more you can get to a bigger audience. And I think science is sort of realizing that more and more. I think the success of this growing creative art movement is helping them realize you know, sometimes those messages spread better. In the end, I think Richard Dawkins said memes are, are evolving faster now than, you know, our biology. So, you know, it's, right. it's so true. Oh, that's fantastic. That's super cool. All right, Tyler, I wanted to sort of turn to you with that same question to start it off in terms of just like that link between art and sustainability that you see and how you, how you pursue that. Yeah, so um, I, I tend to view science and art as the same uh, sort of pathway. They are methods for humans to be observant, to take note of the universe and share those ideas with one another. And I think if you spend enough time being observant and following your path of curiosity, uh, you will find something worth protecting. Um, I agree with the quote that was said earlier. Um, and I think that if you chase your curiosity, you'll find something you love and you'll say, I have to protect this. I don't think that you can be as fully in love with science and art and not want to protect it and not fight for sustainability. Um, and I think the more that we encourage other people to sort of stop distracting ourselves and be okay with um, being observant and taking the time to be present observant, we'll have more people looking around, looking at something worth protecting. And I just, I'm living and waiting and hoping for the day where every human has their one thing that they say, this is worth putting above like everything else from the daily distractions, from the numbing, like this is worth fighting for. And if the billions of us can find something worth preserving, I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna have a beautiful, wonderful planet that I know humans are capable of pursuing and diving and delving into and saying, wow, we, we have held up this like very fragile, precious thing all together. Um, but I think you can't get into art and science and not at the end of it say, wow, I got to preserve this. Like this is everything to the human soul. Oh, that's, that's super interesting. I, 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 and I have to ask you a follow-up, which is not actually a follow-up at all, but it's, it's um, you have to tell us a little bit more about um, crystals and insects. Because I think for those who don't know this field, like I asked you in the preview, I was like, well, is that a very competitive field? Lots of competitors in that space? Um, and, and I think you said, no, not so many. Um, it, it seems to be a fairly, a space that you've developed pretty much on your own. So how, like, when was the like, oh, I have an idea. I'll, I'll put a crystal on an insect. Like, how does that happen? Like, I, I just want to hear a bit more of that creative process. Yeah, it starts with being observant. Um, I was crawling through caves, looking at crystals. Um, I am a self-taught chemist, so I spent a lot of time in college just kind of toying with and diving into chemistry. I wanted to understand the world around me a little bit better. And I did a lot of research on crystallography. And I thought, well, OK, it's not too hard to grow crystals. It, you know, it's a pretty simple process. And I thought, OK, I'll grow some crystals. I'm bored. So I grew some crystals. And then at the same time, I was illustrating a lot of crystals on skulls and crystals on insects, like making drawings of them. And I was looking at one of my drawings. and I said, wait, OK, I drew crystals on insects. And I know how to grow crystals. So what if I actually made <laughs> the crystals on the insects? Um, and so I would go hiking and find cicada shells or like little bones. Right. One time I found like a, a feral a cat skull outside of a cave and I was like, well, I'll take this home and crystallize it. And I was just like, I'll grow crystals on anything but a rock. So, and, yeah. so to be clear, like no, no insects are harmed in your crystal growing. You, it, like, these are dead insects when you start, correct? Yes, yeah, I, and that's yeah. something, that's a funny dance I've had to do my whole career. People saying like, oh, are you grabbing bugs and like submerging them in <laughs> boiling hot water? And I'm like, oh my God, no. <laughs> no, they're all dead. Um, but awesome. it's kind of this beautiful way to preserve life and say, look, even in death, like the world's absolutely stunning. Oh, that, that is, that is, that's fantastic. So I think we're about at a point in this where I want to sort of, I want to bring up, I want to do a little transition here. And I'm, I'm going to introduce our fourth speaker who's going to take us out. And that's Robin Moore, who's uh, the vice president. Come on up, Robin. You can, uh, uh, and we'll, because he's got, Robin, Robin, yeah, come on up. Yes. 
Robin is not only the, the Vice President for Communications and Marketing at Rewild, uh, he's not just a leader at a major environmental organization, he's also a gifted writer, a tremendous photographer, and a scientist. And, and he combines all these things in some exceptional, exceptional ways. And so, you know, one of his books, for example, Searching for the Lost Frogs, was fundamental and inspirational and actually really powerfully helpful in the work that we do in the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute to preserve frogs and bring them back into the wild. So it's this connection between you know, the, the, the passion you bring to the subject, your ability to, to get that out to a huge audience, and then that comes back and helps organizations that are working on the ground to Sorry. do the work that that book is, was all about sort of promoting. And so I think that's true for everyone up here, but I think it's a great way for you to, to finish this off. And, and I wanted to hear a little bit because you do start as a scientist. You are a scientist. You are trained as a scientist. Um, how does that training influence your creativity, both as a, as a storyteller and as a photographer? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Josh. Uh, what a great intro and a hard, a hard panel to live up to. Some great, great, uh, and a lot of themes actually that, that are very similar. And um, really, um, sort of. <laughs> you have competition. I've got, come on, I have to start <laughs> shouting louder. Um, so when I was thinking about what, what to talk about, I kept coming back to something that Tyler really touched on, actually, is sort of thinking like a seven-year-old. And uh, this is my first ever selfie uh, when I was seven. I recovered this from my diary recently. And I show this not to boast about my artistic prowess, <laughs> but more just it, it captures for me that sort of my childhood. This is, in, in case it's not obvious, I'm putting frog spawn into a into an aquarium here. And I spent my childhood just, I grew up in Scotland, just roaming the muirs, f finding uh, frogs, newts, and really sort of indulging my curiosity through this incredible transformation that, that frogs undergo. And so they were my sort of gateway drug into, uh, into the natural world. And, you know, I, I as Josh mentioned, I, I sort of pursued that curiosity through, through science. And I went on to study biology. I did a, a PhD. I went down a postdoc route. And then, yeah, I realized that sort of after my 10,000th sort of scoot that I'd <laughs> counted on a tortoise and papers on body mass index, it wasn't, it, it sort of, it wasn't fueling my curiosity in the way that I, you know, as a child, as a seven-year-old, I had sort of felt. So I, I sort of, I transitioned to, to work more in sort of applied conservation. I went to work for a group called Conservation International. And I, I took my camera everywhere I went. And it turned out that, for me, taking photos was a little easier than freehand. And so I would use my, my, you know, my camera as a tool. I swapped my calipers for, for camera on, and found that you know, images um, I could convey in a very different way. In a, you know, sort of a ghostly frog against the Milky Way, one image can convey you know, what, what sort of a lot of the, the stats and the sort of arid jargon that I was using before just couldn't. And it could sort of be a headline that would get people's attention. And just, just having a camera would allow me to sort of bring people with me on these journeys, you know, lying on the forest floor in Colombia, face to face with, with a snake. You know, not many people want to do that. So these moments where a fly just landed on the snake's head, you know, just capturing these moments and bringing them to life, for me, was my way of sort of sharing and, and um, you know, connecting with people on, on the sort of wonder of the incredible world that we're, you know, we live in. And it also brings you face to face with, with these animals. You know, I think uh, when you're trying to get people to care about frogs, I think we, we're, we're sort of programmed to connect on that individual level. You know, when you tell people there's 2,000 species threatened, it sort of, it doesn't mean anything. It, it's very, you know, you could tell them there's 20, 2,000, 20,000. It doesn't really, it has the same sort of, uh, effect, but I think connecting with one individual. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of um, campaigns that we've done at Rewild, and I'm very, very lucky to work with an incredible team at Rewild and, and really standing on their shoulders here, uh, because uh, Rewild also gives us sort of the, the creative freedom to to think like seven-year-olds and and really indulge our own passion and curiosity. And I think, you know, it's. It can be more powerful to show than to tell, but I think there's an even more powerful way of doing it, and that is asking. So, you know, I think a lot of our campaigns, a lot of our stories start with the question, what if? You know, I think 
we, we like to be so sure about everything. And I think there's great power as scientists when we say we don't know, and we actually bring people on that journey of discovery and say, you know, how about we find out together? And that was really the impetus behind the search for lost frogs that Josh mentioned. We asked, you know, what if these frogs, toad salamanders that we haven't seen in decades are actually still out there? And what if we actually go and look for them? And so for this campaign, we put together a top 10 list because everybody loves top 10s. And it really just helps sort of elevate the sort of poster, poster children of the campaign. You know, it, again, you want to put a face, you want to put a name to these things, and it helps people connect. So we had this top 10. And then the campaign itself like, took me into the, the cloud forest of Haiti, where we found six frog species that hadn't been seen in, in two decades, including, I didn't find it on this coin, <laughs> but this is a quarter, just, just to give you a sense of scale. You know, this is the size of a grain of, grain of rice. Um, to Colombia, where they had incredible glass frogs, you know, smaller than your fingernail, where we found a brand new species to science. And there's just so much out there, you know, that we're still discovering. And again, I think bringing people on that journey of discovery, I think is so critical uh, to engaging, you know, I think we're when we're in communications, we often talk about audience. We talk, we talk about content, but but I think there's such power in trying to figure out how we bring people in and on that journey, rather than just talking at people. And I got to go to the the rainforest of Borneo with a team in search of uh, an incredible toad that hadn't been seen in 87 years, the Borneo rainbow toad. And this is the land of flying frogs. This is Wallace's flying frog. This is one of my bucket list species that I, you know, had to see. And just, you know, I've been working with frogs for decades, but they still absolutely amaze me. Like we came across this, I'd never seen anything like it. It looked like it had been carved out of wood. Um, and this is a Borneo, a Borneo eared frog. So just, I think for me, that's one of the things that draws me to amphibians is just there's an such a richness and a diversity of shapes, forms, colors, behaviors. Um, it's just never ending. So I still see things that I'm hard to believe they're real. And then I was really lucky to actually see in real life, in the flesh, this, this Borneo rainbow toad, which the team rediscovered after 87 years. So, you know, when you find a species that hasn't been seen in almost nine decades, it, it really sort of catapults it into a, a uh, a flagship for conservation and you can leverage that to to raise the profile of the place and say this is really important and, and put the eyes of the world on these incredible places and, and use that sort of sense of pride as well. You know when you have something unique in your own backyard that's making headlines internationally, um, I think it can be a very powerful sort of uh, catalyst for conservation. And again, you know, I think we, we see a lot of the same species over and over. We see the pandas, polar bears, tigers. We spend, you know, I think the under frogs that have incredible stories to tell are, are incredible also flagships for conservation. If only we, we sort of tell these stories. Um, so at Rewild we asked, you know, what if? What if we actually broaden the search for lost frogs to fish, mammals, birds, insects, invertebrates? Um, and so we did, We we worked for a year with scientists, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, on building a list of 1,200 lost species. And we, we did a top 25. We couldn't, we couldn't narrow it down to a top 10, just too many. We got Daniel Craig to hold a red-footed tortoise to help launch it, because why not? <laughs> and you know, he, he lent his voice. Which, which, and in 2017, we launched the Search for Lost Species. And again, we supported scientists to go out looking for these species. And again, it just led to some incredible rediscoveries. This is uh, Wallace's giant bee, the world's largest bee. Hadn't been seen in four decades in Indonesia. And this a friend of mine, Clay Bolt, went and, and captured this image. This is a composite, just to show you the, the relative size. But this is a honey bee, and this is how big the, the giant bee is next to it. And this, I mean, stories like this, this reached over two billion people, media impressions. So images, stories can really, it, it got more media impressions than the, than the UN report on a million species on the brink of extinction or at risk of extinction. Um, which isn't right, but it shows you, I think, the importance of, of sort of the, the individual sort of stories and bringing people in um, through, through these sort of 
I think the particular is very important when you're telling these stories, that people have something very tangible. And you might recognize this face. We, we launched, so we found eight of our uh, top 25, and we refreshed our list and, and relaunched the top 25 with Tyler Thrasher. Uh, I think that was earlier this year, or last, earlier this year. <laughs> I lose track of time. Um, so yeah, we, we produced a video with Tyler Thrasher. He did art. We created a Lost Legends list for some of the species that probably are not still out there, but are kind of reminders, poignant reminders of what we've lost.